The dingo has been roaming the beaches of the world's largest sand island for thousands of years. It's only in the past few decades it's become a source of heated debate. There's just a small number of these serious attacks that just happen year after year after year. Do you get sick of the controversy? I do. I, I really do. It makes it extremely frustrating when it's controversy for the sake of controversy and not based on facts. 7.30 travelled to Gari with senior wildlife ranger Dr Lyndon Berendorf, who's been managing dingo controversies for more than 20 years. How have you coped with it for so long? That's, that's a really good question. I believe in what we're trying to do. We head straight to the latest troubled dingo hotspot, Eli Creek. Although a dingo bit a woman here only days earlier, the visitors we spoke to are relaxed. Does it worry you? No, no, not at all. Again, I haven't had any close encounters. It's just about keeping your distance from them. Have you had any close encounters? Ah, uh, they come around, the girls get, have a bit of excitement when they come, but um, they're, they're fine. They're trying to establish themselves. A wildlife ranger is based at Eli Creek to spread the word about dingo safety. Three campgrounds nearby have been closed until further notice, and last week commercial tour operators agreed to stop serving lunch here. Yet I could still smell a barbecue yes. there. <laughs> So, uh, you know, working with the commercial tour operators is one thing, but also working with every single individual free and independent traveller that comes through there, that's another thing in itself. Oh! The root cause of nearly all problems with dingoes on Gari is simple. Food supplied by humans. They're opportunist animals. They're hunting. Um, you know, I, I like an easy feed. If uh, there was a hamburger running down the beach, then, then I'd be chasing after him as well. And it doesn't matter whether it's a seagull stealing the chip off the table or whether it's a polar bear coming into town. As soon as you start providing food, either intentionally or unintentionally, you're going to end up with conflict. Wildlife ecologist Dr Benjamin Allen says it's a big challenge for rangers on an island that attracts so many visitors. My suspicion is that it's probably as good as we can get it. You've got 500,000 people or thereabouts visiting every year. 1% of that is 5,000. If 1% of people were doing the wrong thing, that's 5,000 meals a year provided to dingoes. Just south of Eli Creek, we come across a single female dingo. She's pregnant and what the rangers call habituated. That is, she's come to associate humans with food. And so I guess part of that management is knowing who she is, how many young she has, and then trying to keep her young from following in the footsteps of what her familiar or habituated family pack might have been. The more dangerous dingoes, like the one who bit a tourist recently, are fitted with radio collars so rangers can track their movements. Only two out of the 180 or so dingoes on the island presently have these collars. We can tell where it's been, what its patterns are, if it's hanging around campgrounds, if it's hanging around those day use areas, and then we can put rangers in those areas where we think that they're going to be there to keep that education up. Just uh, have a bit of, bit of a chat about uh, dingo safety. Visitors are told to keep their distance, not travel alone and avoid high risk behaviour. What can you tell me about dingoes? Well, you're not supposed to run on the beaches because it makes them feel like you're prey, so they start chasing you. That's a great answer. But people still break these simple rules. Oh, it gave me a lick. Authorities say one of the keys is public education, and there are dingo safety and awareness signs all over the island now. In fact, it would be impossible to miss them. But it really does beg the question, what more can be done? my knowledge of human behaviour, even if you sat down and had a 30 minute interview with everybody prior to entering the island, there will still be a small proportion of people who feel they know better or forget and still keep the sort of issue alive. I think that to a point we have saturated and we need to think outside the box to get those few people that just don't seem to be getting the message. If all else fails and a dingo becomes too aggressive, the last resort is euthanasia. 
It's devastating for the traditional owners of Gari, the bachelor people, who say being on country is like looking through the eyes of what they call the Wongari. When they heard of the last one that just happened recently, elders were actually crying, cr crying for the Wongari. So, um, yeah, because it's so hurtful, because it's not the Wongari's fault. Euthanasia is uncommon. Six dingoes have been put down since 2019, including four that were sick. But geneticists are asking what this means in the longer term for such an isolated population. When you have so few animals on the island and when you have few animals that are breeding, uh, removing any particular individual can have a big impact on the population. And we don't want to get to a point where the population does go into an extinction spiral. Scientists hope to better understand this risk to Gari dingoes when a major genetic study is released later this year. But Dr Allen says there's no need to panic. Removing one or two individuals a year doesn't really have any effect on their genetics either. Now you can get cavalier and if you remove a whole bunch of them you can have an effect, but removing one or two doesn't. There's been lots of changes to Gari wildlife management over the past decade. Visitors are now given sticks to warn off any threatening dingoes and there's lots of options for camping behind fences. The aim is to give Gari dingoes enough space to continue to run wild. It's so important to understand the facts. It's so important that we get out the information that we've been able to get collaboratively and as a team for over two decades now. Or as a bachelor put it, it all comes down to respect. When you hear country, you listen to country, you're aware of your surroundings. I appreciate and I respect the Wongri. It's just like the Wongri respects me.